Messages Show. Live streaming now to millions of devices around the world on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire TV, Android TV, YouTube Live, Facebook Live Streaming. Our shows are available video on demand on these channels. And we broadcast daily Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on these channels. On Mondays, Expanding Your Business. Tuesdays, Finding Health Naturally. Wednesdays, Mentoring Our Youth. Thursdays, Pets We Love. And on Fridays, Women in Leadership. Brought to you by our producers and hosts, Jim Grant and Donna Guimwa. Along with our host, Bieta Severin Reed and Emerson Brantley. Supported by our admin team of Michaela Vidal and Gaia Guinoa Balcone Leda. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. And Donna, you got your mic muted. <laughs> This this should actually be Monday instead of Friday, because this is our second really time going be. live. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what they say: third time's a charm, Jim. <laughs> I mean to tell you, I mean to tell you. Welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. The messages of inspirational stories is proudly brought to you by the good guys at the Six Minute Webinar dot com. And as you can tell, we are live. We do not edit or script what we do. <laughs> No, we're not. We're not intelligent. That's had something to do with intelligence, whatever that exactly. word's about. <laughs> What's that mean, anyway? <laughs> yeah, Donna, it's so good to be back with you here in the studio. My oh, goodness, it's good to be back. It's it's been a trying while for me. Yes, it has, and uh, we're so glad that you're back. My goodness, she's been through a lot. She's been in our thoughts and prayers, and uh, she had to come back. Really, she said to check up on me and make sure I was, you know, not doing things off. correctly. <laughs> yeah, goofing off. Well, you know, the one thing I will say about uh, coming back now, I had eye surgery. I had a cataract removed. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they wouldn't do both eyes, just the, the, the worst of the two, my right eye. And mm -hmm. before, I wouldn't wear my glasses because of the glare on the screen, right? It would come across super glary um, and you, or, or, or it would look like I had alien eyes <laughs> and they would just black out. But when he put in the new lens, Jim, he corrected it to where I can actually see what they call a medium close up in my right eye. Hmm. So it's, it's amazing. I can read what's on the screen. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to guess. <laughs> hmm. I use the Braille system myself. <laughs> Oh goodness. My goodness. I know that was an ordeal for you and everything else you've been through. And my goodness gracious. Uh a lot has happened since she's been here. On Mondays, we're having a very special show with our good friend Rennie Gabriel and a gentleman he introduced me to, Mike Wolf. And let me make a, a kind of like a public announcement here, if I may. On Mondays, we're going to be covering how to buy real estate with no money down. And they're using me as a guinea pig because they found out, Donna, I can't spell real estate. <laughs> now, but also, too, if you or someone you know is in danger of foreclosure on your home, please get in touch with us here at our Radio at a radio at our TV station. I'm all goofed up today at a, doing six shows a it week. Be I Monday. Yeah. Exactly. Email us at inspiration e360 TV. The people that we know can work with you without one single dime out of your pocket. They won't ask you for anything. And if they can help you, they will. Okay. So at least right. you got a shot at it. And these folks have been very, very successful in helping people get out of foreclosures and things like that. I'm not saying they can help you or everybody. We know that's not possible. It's worth but, a conversation though. Yes. Especially if it doesn't cost you anything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what we do here. We provide information that's available. Uh, it's a blessing to others because my goodness gracious, all of us need a helping hand once in a while, Donna. Well, absolutely. And the beautiful thing about it is 
You know, there is nothing wrong with getting help. But more importantly, Jim, knowledge is power. Oh, my goodness gracious, yes. Because <clears throat> you share no. a little bit about Rennie. We know his story very well. Yes. Rennie, Rennie and I are the same age. We're 74. Did you know that? I always like to ask her questions when she's drinking or have a cup or something. And you think but, it's tea. <laughs> I know it. He thinks it's tea, yeah. But Rennie was 50 years of age, and when, Rennie was flat broke. B-R-O-K-E broke. I mean broke, broke. Right, with capital. Because, yeah, he said, at 50 years of age, Jim, I was out picking up bottles and cans just so I could try to cash them in and get enough money to buy groceries to feed my family. Now, folks, that's about as poor as you can get. Right. And <laughs> Rennie, I tell you right now, if you contact Rennie, let me put up his website I'll here. It, Jim. I'll get it. Oh, okay. You'll get it. Okay. If you contact Rennie and say that you heard about it on the show, he'll be glad to give you some great advice, give you some great uh, a complimentary counseling, help you answer any questions you got. And he will not charge you one thin dime because 100% of the money that he does earn on the wealth on any income.com goes to nonprofits. And Rennie today is a multimillionaire. He's on, he owns a lot of different uh, um, apartment buildings, I think over 50 apartments or 100 apartments, something like that. I don't know the exact number. But also, too, Rennie is in very many other different industries. So that is the kind yes. of people that Donna and I associate ourselves with. But people Rennie who, is uh, also yeah. very sweet and kind and oh. humble. Yes. Right? Just because a multi-million dollars doesn't mean that he's all up his own self, you know, mm -mm. and got his, you know, nose in the air mm -mm. because he understands what it means to be broke. He understands what it means to struggle and mm -hmm. have too much month at the end of the money. Mm. To give you an example what kind of a guy he is, during 2020 and the pandemic and everybody locked down and everybody wondering if they had enough money or enough toilet paper or whatever the case might be. <laughs> Rennie helped each one of his clients, Ten mm -hmm. his tenants, excuse me, thank you, each one of his tenants to uh, learn how to build wealth on any income. And as a result, not one single tenant missed a rent payment. Okay. That, that just speaks yep. volumes about the man. It does. It really does. Mm -hmm. He's a very, very sweet man. Yes, he is. We're honored to have him as our personal friend. And uh, we're just, we value relationships like that because that's who we are. People, that's a true reflection of our of us as our audience. And it's just everyday people who we help one another. We admit we make mistakes. And I'll tell you right now, one thing that's exciting me about today's show, Women in Leadership, the information Donna found was on ladies. Oh, my goodness gracious. They don't get the proper recognition they no. deserve and have earned in the history books. You know, and unfortunately, Jim, it still to this day is not recognized like it should be. Absolutely. You are so Just, correct. And it doesn't matter where you live in what part of the country. I can guarantee you whether it's, you know, in, um, uh, and I'm not talking about, let me rephrase this. I'm not talking per se, maybe about an entrepreneur who sets their own wage limit, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about when you work for corporate America, mm -hmm. that I'm going to say about 95% of the women are underpaid in comparison what they're doing in across the board evenness with mm -hmm. a man. Yeah. And what gets me about the history books, ladies and gentlemen, you let some guy invent a shoelace and he'll be in the history books. But when you hear what some of these ladies have done, right. holy enchiladas, are you kidding me? And Donna, I'll tell you right now, let's get kicked off into these under these 16 okay. legendary ladies, we probably won't get a chance to cover them all today. No, I don't but think they we are, will. They're not celebrated in history books. 
but their contributions to the world have greatly impacted our society. My right. goodness, Don. Th these ladies are definitely legendary women. They're entrepreneurs. They made this particular list on the entrepreneurswebsite.com. And it's an honor. It's, a, it's way past time. It's Absolutely. way past time. Absolutely. This mm -hmm. first one, uh, just absolutely amazing. It, her name is Eliza Lucas um, Pickney, Pickney. Mm -hmm. 1739, dying to make a difference. Mm. She's known as America's first important agriculturalist for introducing blue indigo dye into continental North America. Hmm. Eliza Lucas was born in Antigua, an island west of the Indies, in 1722. She attended a finishing school in London where she developed a love for botany. When she was still young, her family moved to the U.S. and her father acquired three plantations. At the age of 16, Pickney took over the plantations near Charlestown in the province of South Carolina. After her mother died and her father, a British military officer, returned to the West Indies. Mm -hmm. After realizing that the growing textile industry was creating a need for new dyes, she began making a high-quality blue indigo dye in 1739. Wow. Her creation was a success. Indigo soon ranked second to rice as a South Carolina export crop. Mm. She went on to produce flax, hemp, silk, and figs. Pickney died in 1793, but her legend lives on. She became the first woman inducted into the South Carolina Business Hall of Fame in 1989. 1989, and the poor lady died in 1793. Just a couple that of is, years difference. Yeah, yeah, almost two centuries later. Right. My goodness gracious. And when you think about the dye she invented, I mean, Levi Strauss was pretty proud of that, wasn't he? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, if she hadn't have done it, what, co what color would our blue jeans be? <laughs> well, and the thing is, look at it. So everything that she went on to produce is still in in a production today. It's oh, still yeah. being used. Indigo, flax, hemp, silk, and figs. Every mm. single one of those is being yeah. used today. There is another lady that we want to share some information about. Have you ever heard of Mary Catherine Goddard? G-O-D-D-A-R-D. -D she was an entrepreneur, and her accomplishments have already been noted as a part of American history. She grew up in New London, Connecticut, before moving to Providence, Rhode Island with her mother in 1762. Her famous first began when she became, she became the first woman publisher in America in 1776. Wow. I mean, 1766. think about that. Oh, 1766. You're correct. Her My eyes are better than better. mine. <laughs> Well, her eyes are better, and I think her brain is too, to be honest with you. <clears throat> but in 1775, Goddard became the first American woman postmaster in Baltimore, Maryland. And but she is not; she is most famous for printing the first signed copy of the Declaration of Independence that include the names of all the signers. She remains; po she remained postmaster until she was placed in 1789 then continued as a printer and bookseller until her death in 1816. My Isn't goodness gracious. What an honor for her to be able to be printing the very first copy of the Declaration of Independence. Right. In a man's world, what does that say about her talent? Because that document was so precious to our founding fathers they didn't want Luke or Billy Bob or anybody else who was second rate. They wanted a first class printer. And that's right. the beauty in it. And there's a message in that. It hadn't, didn't mean anything. She was a woman. Right. She was the best in her field. And that's the way, you know, people should be evaluated. 
It really is. Whether they're black or white, male or female, makes no difference. Right. Young or old huh? has no bearing. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm, I'm playing with her today. She hasn't been here in a while. I got to play with her some young or old. Huh? What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> Here but it just, ama- it just amazes me that uh, she earned through her credentials and reputation the right. Think about that. She earned the right to be able to be selected right. to print the first copy of the Declaration of Independence. I'm really impressed with that. Right. I really, truly am. Mm. This site was truly, I, I thought, a treasure trove. Of unsung women heroes. Mm. And, you know, again, we need to celebrate women more. Mm -hmm. And for those of you out there, men uh, who are listening, celebrate the woman in your life. Celebrate your mother. Celebrate your wife, your sister, whatever female figure Mm. is important to you who has um, helped your character, helped you grow, Mm. given you love. Celebrate Mm. them. Just pick up the phone and celebrate them. Yeah, I can think of all the <clears throat> the lady uh, teachers I had growing up, and uh, the in, in school the values that they instilled in us. And this is right, this is wrong, this is why right. it's right, this is why it's wrong. And those ladies, I don't think it, on this side of the Jordan, I don't think any of us, you know, whether we them or, and me collected, if we sat down and talked, I don't think it would be possible for us to realize the impact that they had in our lives. Right. And uh, my goodness gracious, uh, women are great nurturers of young kids, male and female, Absolutely. that they really are. And uh, you, ladies ha- you ladies have the ability to give us an anchor in life because everybody needs an anchor of life in life when the winds of adversity blow, you know? Mm-hmm. We do. And I think it's important, at least for me, when I have young people in my life, um, Mm -hmm. whether they're related or they're just they come into my life and they're just friends. It is super important to me to not only obviously be a good person and a a good friend, but reach out and help them. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is part of why we're here. And that we get to that certain age, you know, where we're here to help people on their journey. Yes. You know, when you said that it brings to mind, I saw an interview uh, several years ago, when I say several years ago, several decades ago, where this guy was wanting to be recognized as a hero. And he says, I'm not a hero. He says, so many times we get puffed up with pride and we want to take credit for something that's a gift from a higher source. He says, that higher source gave me that particular gift to be used in that moment of need to help that individual or help those individuals. He said, that's all I did. Right. And I never have forgotten that. And that is so true because I've met a lot of people who are, you know, uh, like Rennie says, when it comes to, you know, wealth, wealth is not a, wealth is a team sport is the way he puts it. You need help. And that's why he loves to help others. And it's very important for us to remember that our gifts and our talents are here for us to use to be a blessing to others. And goodness, you know, Donna, this next lady, oh my goodness. Off the hook. Yeah. So this is 1875 and her Mm -hmm. name is Lydia Pinkham. Mm -hmm. And she is the Ann Landers of the 1800s. Some would call her the Ann Landers or Dr. Ruth of the 1800s. In 1875, Lydia Estes Pinkham of Lynn, Massachusetts, converted her herbal home remedies into a big business by skillfully marketing her products toward women and educating them about health issues. Pinkham's vegetable compound became one of the best known uh, patent medicines of the 19th century. Pinkham was deemed a crusader for women's health in an age when women's needs weren't being met by the medical community. Mm-hmm. Cooper Laboratories bought the company in 1968, though pills and a liquid 
uh, stamp with Pink Hen's name are still available in some drugstores. Holy smokes. Right? And you I, know, the beauty in that, Donna, she didn't do it for the money. No. Uh-uh. She didn't do it for the money. No, she just, she, she, as a female, saw a area that was lacking in society. Mm. And she stepped up to the plate mm. to make a difference. Yeah. There's a message in that for entrepreneurs because uh, we've said many times, uh, we talk to people who are interested in, you know, being successful in business. And we ask them, you know, what is it you want to do? I want to make money. Well, that's the poorest excuse on planet earth. Because it's the if byproduct you're, of what you do. Making yeah, money it's, the, it's a reward the of your efforts. It's the right. reward of your efforts. Yeah. I mean, and, that'll come. Yeah. And you need to be focused on how you can, how your product, whether it be a, a physical product like a cream or something like that, or if it's a program or whatever it might be, uh, you got to focus on how can this be a blessing to others? What, what problem does this solve in their life? My goodness. Right. And uh, then, you know, them buying from you, that's the reward of your efforts. It just, it just really amazes me how many people do not understand that. Right. This next lady, my goodness gracious, 1905, Madam C.J. Walker. She was carving the path for women entrepreneurs. She's considered one of the 20th century's most successful women entrepreneurs. They refer to her, they call her Madam C.J. Walker. She built her entire empire out of nothing. Her parents were former slaves. She was orphaned at the age of seven. In 1905, she created M Madam Walker's Wonderful Hair Grower, a scalp conditioning and healing formula. And Walker had a personal connection to the product since she suffered from a scalp ailment that caused her to lose most of her hair. So this lady had skin in the game, you might say. She eventually expanded her business to Central America and the Caribbean. By 1917, this lady held one of the first national meetings of businesswomen in Philadelphia. The Madam C.J. Walker Hair Culturist Union of America Convention. Her hard work and perseverance carved a path for women entrepreneurs. This, uh, the African-American hair care and cosmetic industry and the American, the African American community as a whole. I mean, my goodness gracious! Look at all the things that she had to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, her her parents were former slaves. She was orphaned at the age of seven. But that just defined who she was because she knew she was made from tough bricks, so to right. speak. She wasn't right. going to let circumstances define her. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge message in that, in there, Donna? <laughs> oh, you know I'm a big believer of that, Jim. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I honestly think it's what we stand up to mm -hmm. for everybody. But, you know, today is about, you know, women leadership. So mm -hmm. I think it's even more important um, for women, especially when we have young children mm -hmm. around us. And you, it is so important for us to show the way for our children because they see how we act and react. And we all know they're sponges, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when we act a certain way or we are defined or not defined by circumstances in our life, that is what helps define uh, the growth pattern of our next generation. It certainly does. And uh, it's just amazing how, uh, was it Zig Ziglar that said, your attitude will determine yep. your altitude? Yes. Oh, my goodness. And Henry Ford was famous. He's one of the people I think was famous. I don't know who actually uh, came up with the phrase. It could be uh, Henry Ford. But, um, you know, <clears throat> if you think you can do a thing or if you think you can't do a thing, you're right. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. And it just blows me away that, uh, you know, we can be anything we want to be. We can, 
you know, our focus should be on how can we be a blessing to others. Right. Um, what can we I keep do going to, over that. What can we do to help somebody's life be better? Mm -hmm. To improve in somebody's life yeah. one way or the other. So this next woman, you know, I think we've all heard of her. Mm -hmm. um, but 1909, Making Over America. She brought makeup from the stage to everyday life and slowly developed a global empire. Elizabeth Arden was actually born Florence Nightingale Graham in Woodbridge, Ontario, moved to New York at the age of 30 to pursue her dream of building a cosmetics corporation. There she began working with a chemist to create a beauty cream something new for the cosmetics industry at that time. After traveling to Paris in 1912, Arden became the first person to introduce the concept of eye makeup to American women and offered the first makeovers in her Fifth Avenue salon. Arden died in 1966, but her brand name became as well known across the U.S as singer sewing machines and Coca-Cola. Wow. So uh, obviously this this article's a little bit older but just just mm -hmm. to, uh, <clears throat> to give you the the nuts and bolts of it. At the end of its fiscal year in June 2007, the company reported a 1.1 billion in net sales. Mm. Up more than 18% from 955 million in wow. 2006. You probably didn't see me smile there for a moment when you're talking about cosmetics because a funny story popped in my mind. Remember Mary Kay, uh, cosmetics Mary mm -hmm. Kay, and her top uh, producers, I'd say. Yeah, yep. top the reps. They get a pink, a pink Cadillac, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this guy I knew out in Arizona, his wife was a top rep, and uh, his truck was in the... <laughs> was in the, the shop so he had to go somewhere and some he had to on the only vehicle available was his wife's pink cadillac so he had to drive it and fortunately you know unfortunately for him fortunately for his buddies they saw him driving it and stopped and says hey you got anything that make me look a little better today it started you know <laughs> guys just started ribbing him up right. one side down the other. oh my truck's in the shop i had to drive this thing that's okay man we understand it's the Finland side of you <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, maybe I shouldn't have shared that, but you know, as guys, man, we, we love to rib each other and stuff like that. And you know, you know that you know that you know the guys would do that. <laughs> well, yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, though, they're all thinking, "Man, that's a nice Cadillac," and it was, and yeah, it didn't cost them a dime. Yep, they knew his wife was successful, and right. uh, that was an amazing thing. And I'll tell you something, in 1910, Coco Chanel revolutionized the fashion uh, industry, one accessory at a time. And a quote that she said was, may my legend prosper and thrive. I wish it, I wish it a long and happy life. And her legend certainly has lived on since she died back in Absolutely. 1971. Mm -hmm. At the time of her death, Chanel's fashion empire brought in more than $160 million a year. That doesn't sound like much money in this day and time, but $160, $160 million in 1970, what was gas prices then? About 45 or 48 cents a gallon, I think, yeah, or something like I was going to say right in there because I remember milk was running like 25 cents a gallon. Oh yeah, and that's and that's back when someone you know if you ask how much it costs, well it's just chicken feed because chicken feed didn't cost much. You go down now and try to buy a bag of chicken feed, you better have some some deep pockets on with some with some buck stuff in there, right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know she was a wonderful, enterprising lady, a true entrepreneur, and you know the she was born. In Samoa, France, I believe you pronounce that. Set Samoa, I think it is. And she opened her first shop back in 1910, selling only women's hats. In 1921, the company had introduced Chanel Number no. Five, the very first perfume sold worldwide. 
Yep. And from there, the name Chanel became known across the world today. And today, Chanel's creations continue to attract the wealthy, celebrity-filled consumer base. Chanel was, uh, she'll always be associated with her little black dress, her timeless suits, shoes, purses, and jewelry. As Christian Dior once said, with a black pullover and 10 rolls of pearls, she revolu revolutionized the fashion industry. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Absolutely. And, and these ladies we've covered so far, Donna, they had humble beginnings. Very humble beginnings. Yeah. You know? but, but they all had a vision and they all had a purpose. And, and it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't the money. It wasn't they, they said, well, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to seek money. That came with it. It was yeah. their, their, their driving purpose, their life's calling is what chose them to take mm -hmm. the path that they took. Yeah. And every one of these women, they had a very successful game plan. Many times in business, regardless of what level of business it is, people want to go after the big prize. And... You know, think mm -hmm. about Sam Walton. Sam Walton built his empire right. off of everyday people. And these ladies here, their focus was on serving an everyday person. That was mm -hmm. it. And think of all the masses of everyday people out there that you could be a blessing to. That should be a tremendous uh, inspiration to you, I think. Oh, Absolutely. You know, this next lady was, you know, I've never heard of her until this reading this article. 1932, mm. Olive Ann Beach, mm -hmm. skyrocketing to success. Olive Ann Beach co-founded Beach Aircraft Corp in Wichita, Kansas, wow. alongside her husband, Walter, at the height of the Depression in 1932. Together... The beaches grew the business from 10 employees to 10,000. Mm. 270 of their Beach Model 17 Stagger Wings were manufactured for the U.S. Army during World War II. But after Walter died suddenly from a heart attack in 1950, Olive Ann became president and CEO of the company. During her nearly 20 years in charge, she transformed the company into a multi-million dollar aerospace corporation. Olive Ann retired in 1968, but continued to serve on the board of directors until 1982, just two years after the Raython Corp purchased Beach Aircraft. Beach became the company's first chairman, uh, Emera, uh, oh Lord. Emeritus. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah. What, whatever that word is. Yeah, my tongue's not going to go around that one today, folks. Before <laughs> dying at home in Wichita in 1993, mm. Beach Aircraft Corporation had a lasting impact on general aviation and producing some of the most popular aircraft of the 20th century. You know, it's really amazing in that story. Her and her husband were true visionaries. Mm -hmm. What year did she found her and her husband found Beach Aircraft? 1932. Uh-huh. At the height of the Depression. Right. And you know what people would think, my goodness gracious, if people can't afford a car. Right. How are they going to afford an airplane? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but it just goes to show you keep the faith, believe in yourself, don't ever give up. Right. Don't ever give up because only quitters quit. Right. That's that's losers quit. Well, winners and I think, I think one of the other interesting things in this uh, article, Jim, is that they did really well. And then when her husband died, you know, she became the president and the CEO. Mm -hmm. And within 20 years... Mm -hmm. She transformed that company into a multi-million dollar aerospace corporation. Mm. So, and they, yeah, cool. they went from 270 Beach Model 17 Stagger Wings mm -hmm. uh, manufactured for the U.S. Army in World War II mm -hmm. during the Depression. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, yeah. It, it just really amazes me how people, uh, another company started in the Depression selling uh, cakes out of the trunk of their car. And then, yes. you know, they were, they had a, a little bakery with a, it was just one building with a curtain mm -hmm. in front was the bakery behind was their living quarters. Only a curtain separated the bedroom and the living quarters from the bakery. And we've all seen them. Even if oh, you haven't seen yeah. them, oh, every one of us has seen them. I know I still fudge once in a while and get some, you know. <laughs> Because those treats, they I they, tell Evelyn that you, that you go out oh oh she knows then. she knows I mean uh, you know she <clears throat> you know I still uh, get corrected on that you might say but anyway no she's really good she didn't say anything <laughs> but uh, in 1960 they built the ideal bakery that they needed and they didn't know what to call their product. Because these folks during the Depression, they were running right. around in a 1928, was it a Whippet? I think it was, car, selling yeah. nickel cakes out of the trunk during the Depression. And 1960, when they finally kept working and saving their money and they built that bakery, they said, what are we going to call our desserts? And they named it after their granddaughter. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you guys may have heard or may have <laughs> tried some of Little Debbie snacks. Yep. <laughs> Aren't they great? Yeah, oh, they are. Oh, I love them. <laughs> I love them. I just wish they loved me as much as I love them. <laughs> It'd be healthy <laughs> for me. <laughs> oh, my, my goodness. goodness. You know, in, in talking about these ladies here, this lady here, <clears throat> I tell you right now, uh, Ma Perkins. Did you ever hear of Ma Perkins before this, Donna? Yes. You had? Okay. I have it. Okay. In 1933, Ma Perkins, she became mother of the airways. She's a radio legend who captured the hearts of Americans with her kindness and down to earth point of view. Wow. Actress Virginia Payne brought the character Ma Perkins, also known as America's mother on the, of the air to life in more than 7,000 episodes of her radio soap opera. She was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and she made her radio debut at the old age of 23. <laughs> when, she, when the show premiered on a Cincinnati radio station back in 1933, the character of Ma Perkins was a self-sufficient widow who owned and managed a lumber yard and offered her homespun advice to those who sought help. The show ran on NBC and CBS until 1960, and Payne played the title role over the show's entire, um, over the entire span. Uh, she died in 1977, 11 years before she and her alter ego, Ma Perkins, were introduced into the Radio Hall of Fame. Now imagine a 23-year-old young lady right. playing the part of Ma Perkins and all of the good advice, she she was a trailblazer. She mm -hmm. really was. You know, uh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of like reminds me a little bit of Vicki Lawrence. She was 19 <laughs> or 20 when she started playing. <laughs> Mom. Her, mama. Yeah, yeah mama. Yeah. I'm Carol Burnett. Oh, my goodness gracious. That was one of the, if you haven't, for you young folks out there, if you have not what seen treasure. You know, the Carol Burnett, so, Burnett show or, or Mama's Family, go to YouTube and check it out. That is, if you like, good, clean humor. Yeah, I and mean, one of the funniest skits they did was uh, with Tim Conway and Dick Van Dyke was on there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Vicki Lawrence and Carol Burnett. Mm -hmm. And Tim Conway was known for going <laughs> going AWOL, right? He wouldn't go with the script, and he was absolutely brilliant funny. And it was the the one you have to look up is about the elephants. Yeah. <laughs> it is absolutely hysterical. And so you will see the Carol Burnett show with uh, uh, Tim Conway and the elephants. Oh yeah, and you'll see them cracking up on live TV. This oh, was yeah. live TV, and yeah. here's Tim. Just I mean, he was a tremendous comedian. He was funny. Oh, I don't he want to was spoil Robin it. Robin Williams of <laughs> early years. Oh, my goodness. Was. 
I tell you, he, he is a scream, tremendous. And Harvey Corman couldn't keep a straight face around oh, no. Tim Conway. And another one is the dentist office. That's another class. Oh, my gosh. That one was too funny. That one was too funny. Yes. And we share that with you. We share that with you today because, you know, laughter is one of the best medicines on planet Earth. And you need to treat yourself to some good humor because, oh, Absolutely. we were, you know, we just took it for granted growing up like that. You know, Donna's younger than I am by about 30 years. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we just took stuff like that for granted. Today, you folks, uh, young folks, uh, you got cheated. I mean, oh, when yeah. it comes to good humor. Some of the stuff we saw in the 70s would not even make the airways today. Forget, forget the Jeffersons and all in the family. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. No, they would be on the happen. 6 p.m. news and they'd be peeling potatoes up the penitentiary for some of the stuff they did. <laughs> but we, we, we understood it was just good humor. And right. we've got a little bit sidetracked here. And I think you want to pick up with Estee Lauder. I think I'd be Actually, the next I'm lady. Actually, jump to Brownie Wise. Okay, yeah. Okay, that's cool. So interesting about her. So in 1950, Brownie Wise, the planner behind the party, her knack for sales, charm, and ambition helped launch a product as common to most American kitchens as forks and knives. Hmm. Wise was a single mom in 1939 when she got her lucky break. After selling Stanley home products in the early 1950s, she realized that Tupperware would be sold more efficiently at home parties than at department stores. Wise's party plan marketing system began outselling the stores, and that's when Tupperware's inventor, Earl Tupper took notice and hired Wise as vice president of the company. Mm. In 1958, Tupper fired Wise after the press suggested that she was the key to Tupperware's success. Wise died in 1992, but her making tactic lives on to this day, um, but her marketing tactic Tactics. lives. Lives. Tactic lives on to this day. Companies mm -hmm. such as Mary Kay Cosmetics and Cookie Lee Jewelry have followed in her footsteps by adopting the home party marketing method to selling their own products. And that's just to name a few. I think we can honestly say that there are hundreds of marketing programs mm -hmm. that people do from home that are just like that. They have a, a, a home gathering to reach the masses and that's what it was all about instead mm -hmm. of just going one person one person you bring people into a comfortable setting and you can talk to eight nine ten twelve twenty people mm, exactly <clears throat> exactly one time it just amazes me her name brownie wise is just like it sounds b-r-o-w-n-i-e-w-i-s-e and I tell you right now, what does that say about Earl Tupper? He realized that, you know, if, if he hired her as vice president mm -hmm. and his business just boomed. But look at the ego, ego here. Oh, yeah. He, this is pitiful. This is borderline ignorant mm -hmm. and also stupid. It really is. I mean, right? because he took notice after he hired his, his vice president of the company, but he fired her after the press suggested she was the key to Tupperware success. Right. Mm. You know, Donna, if that had been me, I would have agreed with the press all the way to the bank. <laughs> you know, really, I would have. I really right? would have. I mean, I, my absolutely. goodness. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a rather than ego praise talking her, and what he did. Yeah. that That's a, uh, rather than praise her for her foresight and her ability to believe in his product, Right. And to say what a blessing it was for her to believe in my product that strongly to create an entire new marketing thing. And it's a win-win situation for us all. And it's, you know, she should be honored. But his, well, well his he, rear end overloaded kind of his brain. Like the, I was going to say he looked like the uh, south end of a donkey that was heading north. Yeah, that attitude <laughs> gets about as ugly as a ward on a hog's rear end, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. 
It's just, you know, and ever you see, the sad part of it is everybody knew the true story that he's got an right. ego the size of Mount Everest. I mean, he should be ashamed of himself. My goodness. Of course, I know he's no longer around, but I mean, th that's pitiful. That is yep. plum pitiful because giving people the proper respect they've earned and, you know, praising them publicly, all oh, that would have just exploded sales. Mm hmm. Think about yep. how the ladies would feel about that because ladies were the customers. Right. How they would feel if a man stood up and said, this lady here had great foresight. She had, she saw things that I didn't see. And because they of would her, increase their sales even more precisely, precisely. I guarantee you in my house and I'll bet you the in fact, I don't even have to bet. I know it's the same in yours. Uh, you don't go and go up to Evelyn, nor does my husband come up to me and say, honey, what do you think about these dishes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. As long yeah, as y'all can eat on them, you're happy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, <clears throat> that's kind of like, you know, if we get something new in the house, you know, and, and uh, Evelyn put a comforter that we got uh, on the bed. It's very special. It's very special to us because it's got pictures of all of our family there. And, uh, but if it, if, if she does put something on the bed or spices something up, I don't run around going, Oh boy, we got new pillowcases, Ooh, you know, because guys just don't get excited about that. Right. And that's just the way we're wired, but we do appreciate it. We may not say it, but we really do appreciate it because it shows the love and compassion that the lady has and what she's doing. And that's exactly what Brownie Wise did. She demonstrated the love and compassion that she had to make Tupperware. Hmm. Everybody's heard of Tupperware. Right. I mean, I would think everybody has. Most people have, that's for sure. And it'd been interesting, interesting to, to know, of course, we never will know, right. if Brownie Wise had not came into uh, Earl Tupper's uh, life, how well his business would have been. You know, because he didn't really have anything proprietary. No. He really no. didn't. No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. He did not. And well, I tell you, yeah. Well, I think we're getting we another one here. For one more. Oh yeah, uh, we You're still up. get these. We, <clears throat> thank you very much, <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm real glad to be here. Glad, glad to be up. This lady here, we still enjoy getting her magazines in. Lillian Vernon. Mm -hmm. And 1951, they call it the Mail Order Madness. Before the company went private in 2003, Lillian Vernon, Vernon's empire was worth more than $238 million. It and was she the was pajamas to get something from oh. that catalog. Oh yeah, I mean everybody. I, I mean, I used to, I used to love looking through that catalog. It was a treat. Mm -hmm. And she was born in, is that Leipzig, Germany in 1929, yeah. and she came to the U.S. in 1937 when the Nazi threat intensified. Back in 1951, ladies and gentlemen, she decided she was going to start a mail order business and named for her Mount Vernon, New York home. And <clears throat> after a second divorce in 1990, she took Vernon as a surname but Vernon used $2,000 of her wedding gift funds to buy a variety of matching purses, belts, and placed an ad in 17 magazines. Soon, $32,000 in orders came flooding in. And she published her first catalog, the Vernon Catalog, in 1956, offering personalized combs, blazer buttons, collar pins, cufflinks, and by 1970, Lillian Vernon Corporation hit $1 million in sales. And we talked a little bit earlier about how much $1 million would buy in 1970 if gas was like 45 cents a gallon or something like it was, it right. was, it was under 50 cents a gallon. I remember that, mm -hmm. but the company expanded its items to encompass holiday decor gifts, household items, fashion, extra uh, accessories, children's products, Boys. after 50, Hmm? Toys? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. After 51 years as CEO, the personalized gift pioneer stepped down in 2002. The company, which filed for bankruptcy protection in February, was, was acquired by a Current USA. The company's name is Current, C-U-R-R-E-N-T, USA Incorporated. 
and they got it for $15.8 million. So if My I recall goodness. right, Jim, Current was the company that used to make, because I used to buy those, Current Cards. Do you remember those? Mm, can't say that I do. Current Cards, and they were some of the cutest dadgum little cards. This was when you actually wrote and sent notes in the mail to people, right? It's a big thing. You always, always sent a thank you note and thinking about you. And I would buy those cards from current catalog and they were absolutely so sweet little. Mm. Um, there was all different kinds, but the ones I always liked, of course, a, a big surprise was the animals and the nature scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. Right. I, I remember, you know, there used to be a lot more personalized things you could get. And I remember after Dom and I got married, we uh, ordered some Christmas cards and, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was, but it's very unique. I've never seen anything like it before. I didn't see anything like it before and hadn't seen it since. But you'd open it up, had a little mailbox, and had a little letter like sticking out of the mailbox. You pull it out and had a little note there. Right. And uh, it was very, very unique. Current USA. My goodness, we're almost out of time. We are. I don't even mm. think we really have quite enough time to get into this next one. Well, let's see here. Miss Ruth Handler, 1915. Creating mm. an American icon, the Barbie doll. Mm. She changed the way little girls played and dreamed and was forever left her stamp on American culture. Handler came up with the idea of creating a doll that looked more like an adult after noticing that her daughter preferred to play with paper dolls that look like adults. Although her husband didn't think the idea would sell, Handler debuted Barbie, her daughter's nickname, at a New York toy fair in 1959. Mm. Handler and her husband, Elliot, were already selling dollhouse furniture and other toys through their company, Mattel, based out of their Hawthorne, California garage. <clears throat> Within five years, Mattel became a Fortune 500 company in 1967, Handler became president of Mattel, Inc., a position she stayed in until 1974. Her legacy lives on today, and Barbie brings in more than $1 billion a year for Mattel. Mm. Mm. That's, That's a lot simply, of potatoes. Oh, yeah. You can buy the groceries, pay the rent, and go downtown on a Saturday night with that kind of money. It's really, right. it's really amazing. And we think about these ladies here, many of them we talked about, I had never heard of before. And, right. or we, we may have recognized a few products along the way, but we didn't realize the mind, the foresight, foresight the vision, and the energy and behind And the name it. behind the products. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Uh, I tell you, I'm still hung up on that. I'm that young lady that was, uh, she was a former, her parents were former slaves and she was an orphan by the mm -hmm. age of seven. And Madam, uh, I'm looking for a name here, Madam C.J. Walker. Yes. She didn't let anything like it define her. And so many times out here in the world today, we're hearing things how, you know, because you're this or because you're that, whatever, you're, you're, you're handicapped. And the only thing that gets right. handicapped in the real world is between is the gray matter between the ears. Right. <laughs> it really is. That's about the truth. And that's the only yeah. thing that's going to stop you, folks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't need a break from time to time and a little slowdown, mm -hmm. but don't right. let it stop you. There you go. Don't let it stop you. Jim, we are out of time. And I'm out of quarters. I can't buy any more time. I know it. I know it. I know it. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in today. Donna, so good to have you back with us. And uh, Good to be back. You bet. And uh, you've, been, you've been sorely missed in more ways than thank one. You. you really have. And um, we just want to, we close every show with remember that you deserve to be loved. You need to love yourself first, and then you can love others. And as Donna likes to say, love yourself enough to give yourself grace. Grace, absolutely. Because many times we're very quick to forgive somebody else, but kind of slow to forgive ourselves. Be sure absolutely. and forgive yourself first. 
And most importantly, uh, once again, very quickly, as time is very short here, if you know someone that is in a financial uh, situation with their home or something like that, and you'd like for us to put them in touch with uh, someone uh, that can help them, I'm looking for our website right now. I'll just say it. <clears throat> Email us at inspiratione 360 tv if someone is in the danger of losing the home, forecloses taxes, whatever. We can at least put you in touch with someone that can maybe help them out of that situation. But I can guarantee you they will not ask for one single dime. Yep. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We appreciate you. Those of you that view us around the world in India, Pakistan, Europe, uh, Philippines, uh, Canada, Mexico, even in the United States. So I think we got one or two viewers here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, thank you so much. We'll see you on Monday. We'll be back with Rennie Gabriel and Mike Wolf. We're looking forward to that. They're the guys that's helping us in the world of real estate, how to acquire real estate with no money down. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, folks.